Hey, I hope you're doing well. Welcome to this live coaching session. My name is Ian. I'm the founder here at EssentialTennis.com, and it's my mission to bring passionate instruction to passionate players just like you. And today, we're going to be doing just that. I'm going to be asking five, or rather answering five questions that I've received uh, from the community. Looking forward to it a lot. And uh, these are the topics that we're going to be talking about today. Number one, how to get sponsored. And is that something that regular everyday tennis players can accomplish. Uh, I've been sponsored a couple different ways and I'm gonna tell you exactly how that happened. Single strategy plan A. What is the s core strategy you should go into your singles play with? How to play to win instead of playing not to lose, which is a really common problem that players have. Um, how to beat a weak second serve, one that lands kind of really short and sits in the box. And finally, how to analyze your own tennis game and improve. So let's go ahead and jump uh, right into it. Question number one today from Daniel. How can a 4045 club player get a sponsorship? I've been a loyal player with the Wilson Pro Staff 95. I buy overgrips and strengths since I started back in the 90s. And in 2012, got back into the game to present sticking with Wilson Pro Staff. I'm sorry, <laughs> to present sticking with Wilson Pro Staff. And now with Clash 100 rackets and US Open balls and overgrips, I never play with anything else but Wilson. Are there benefits to being loyal for club recreational players? Okay, so Daniel, really good question. I'm sure this is uh, something that a lot of people are, are wondering out there. And obviously it would be really cool to be able to figure that out, right? Well, so uh, from my experience in the tennis world for 30 years now, <clears throat> here's how it's worked for me. I played Division II college tennis. And as a college player, I didn't get free rackets. Um, I w they were kind enough, the program was kind enough to supply us, the players, with a couple pairs of shoes per year, and they paid for our strings, which was fantastic. I actually, believe it or not, I broke a lot of strings back then, and so that helped a lot. But all of us on the team played with different rackets, and so the program, like the coach wasn't about to tell us, hey, we're a Wilson program and make everybody play with Wilson, or everybody play with Prince or Babolat, or like Dunne, or you know, whatever. So we all paid for our own rackets. All throughout college, that was the case for me. Then as I started teaching full-time, I got a sponsorship with, with uh, just happens to be Wilson. So I was with Wilson for a long time. I played with, with all of the 6-1 line of rackets from college on up through the point that they stopped making those rackets. <clears throat> so with that agreement, I would get two rackets per year, two pairs of shoes. They would give me strings and grips and, and that sort of thing. And that kind of makes sense in a club environment because in a club environment, I'm working with students every day, all day, and we have a pro shop. You know, there's a retail establishment right there. And so it's kind of a, a natural thing for me to make recommendations. It's a natural thing for people to walk in and be like, oh, hey, I, I've been playing with this racket for a long time. What do you think about it? Should I try something new? or my strings are kind of old, like, what do you recommend? And so I was in a, a naturally in a position where people would ask me for recommendations. And so it made sense for Wilson to hook me up a little bit in exchange for saying, well, here's what I play with, and here's what I like, and here's what I recommend. And so it made a lot of sense for Wilson to kind of support me a little bit on the side financially in exchange for them being kind of the go-to you know, brand that I talked about. So that was the case as a, as a full-time teaching pro in like a normal club environment. So for the last 11 years, I've been doing this full-time. I've been making content. And over the years, I've approached Wilson. I've approached Babolat. And I've had, I've had conversations with the decision makers at like corporate, like the people in charge of like marketing and branding and sponsorships at these different companies. And they're totally uninterested in somebody like me because I no longer am connected directly with any kind of retail merchandising outlet. And my website doesn't sell rackets or strings. And so I'm kind of in a weird position now where even though I, I have a lot of reach and a lot of people consume the content that I create, the big brands that have kind of an old school business model don't really see me fitting in with, with what they do. So I'm just trying to give you a context here. And so I started working with Diadem because they're a new company, uh, much younger people in charge, 
and they have uh, an online presence and online you know e-commerce presence that's very different compared to all the old brands. And so that's why I'm working with, with Diadem and it's worked out really well. So I get to provide a discount for my audience and Diadem hooks me up with basically whatever I need. I, I just ask one of the co-founders whenever I need rackets or strings or whatever and they hook me up. So here's my recommendations for you, Daniel, as a 4045 player. I share all that just to kind of give you a little bit of my experience and a little bit of background. So. Here's what I recommend you do as a 4045 player. Number one, <clears throat> get to know your local slash regional Wilson representative. There's somebody that is designated to your area, wherever you live, uh, and it might be several states or it might just be a state or th there's some kind of territory like manager uh, for your area. Find out who that is and get to know that person. Develop a relationship with that person. Tell her or him the story of how much you love Wilson and your history of using their products and, and get to know them like on a personal level. <clears throat> I've always known my local Wilson people over the years and those relationships have been really beneficial for them and also for, for me as well. Number two, get a, if, if at all possible, get a position at a club where you can make sales. It doesn't have to be a job necessarily. Um, you could do some volunteering. Uh, maybe there's some like little kids classes that need some covering. Maybe there's some desk hours that need some covering. If you know how to string, maybe there's some stringing that needs to be done. And so if necessary, maybe get like a little part-time job and just get your foot in the door in a position where you can start to make recommendations to people. And so if you combine number one and number two together, then there starts to become maybe a little bit of a little bit of a path for you to develop that relationship with that ambassador, that territory manager in your area, and maybe something could happen. The third option, which is pro frankly probably the hardest one, <clears throat> is do what I'm doing: create content, grow an audience, and then go to one of the manufacturers and say, "Hey, I, I'm in front of this many people every day, and I'd love to be an ambassador for your brand." Can we work something out? What, unfortunately, in the world of tennis, the whole content thing is still kind of like Greek. Like, like it's like speaking Greek. You know, like they they just don't get it. They still don't quite understand it. In my experience, it's just my personal experience, and so it's hard to get them to understand the value of the exposure. So that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, number one and number two is much more the normal route, and I recommend probably that first. But here's the here's the bottom line. If you're not influencing any purchase decisions, it's just not, it's not gonna happen. Uh, if you just think Wilson's the coolest and you're like the biggest fan ever, they're, they're just basically gonna say, thanks, that's great. Please keep sending us your money and we'll keep sending you our products. If there isn't any other like auxiliary way that you can influence buying decisions, if you're not working with students, if you don't have some kind of following, if you don't have some kind of influence, you know, as they say these days, then you're just you're they're not going to be interested in any kind of like official sponsorship. Now just getting to know the territory person, maybe you'll get hooked up here and there. And that's very possible if you just have a personal relationship with the the local or like the area, the regional person. So that's why I recommend you figure out who that is and, and start a relationship with that person. So hopefully that all makes sense, uh, Daniel. Great stuff. Good question. On to question number two, we're going to be answering five uh, questions today. Here's, here's the second one. <clears throat> Coming to us from Matthew today. I find myself struggling with having a single strategy and actually having a plan with each point I go into in college. So it sounds like a college player here. I feel like I'm just going out there without any intention or game plan. So something involving that would be great. All right, Matthew, perfect. Uh, I'm going to give you a, like a very specific, like exact game plan that you should have as a singles player specifically. And this is so critical that you don't just go out there and wing it, which most tennis players are doing. And I just want to congratulate you for just being honest and coming forward with this question. Look at the, uh, the four you know, thumbs up here in a short period of time. A lot of people resonate with this. And that's because a lot of players are going out there without a plan. So the plan A I'm about to give you is based on geometry and margin for error. And this is why. This is data over a million points analyzed from a big thank you to Warren at tennisanalytics.net. What you're looking at here is a chart uh, for men and for women. They broke it into male, female. 
And from levels, NTRP 3 to 4 to national level juniors in the 12s, national level juniors in the 14s, 16s, 18s, NCAA competitors, and in professional players. And so you see the corresponding numbers here. This is the number of errors to winners. So at the 3040 level, men and women are making more than four unforced errors for every winner that they hit. I'm sorry, let me, let me adjust that. Four, 3040 players are making more than four errors. It's combining forced errors and unforced errors, just to be really clear. <clears throat> for every winner that they hit. If you're a national level junior, you're making between three and four. If you're up close to college age, you're making a little bit less than three errors per winner. If you're a college player, a little bit less than that. If you're a professional tennis player, between two and you know about two and a half or so errors for every winner that you hit. So the vast majority of points for tennis players of all levels, but especially normal tennis players, you know, like us, we're making four to five times more mistakes than we are hitting a winning shot. That's a shot that bounces twice without our opponent even getting to it or touching it. So for that reason, <clears throat> we have to be very conscious and cognizant of picking patterns that minimize our chances of making a mistake. That should kind of be the foundation of a, of a good strategy. So. On the baseline, most of the time you should hit cross courts. I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. There's a lot of coaching on this out there, but there's one thing I'm really gonna focus on. The net is lower when you hit cross courts. The court is longer when you hit cross courts. Timing is easier. We'll talk about this a little bit. I'm about to go to a strategy board when you hit cross court. Compared to receiving a cross court shot and then changing direction and going down the line, hitting the ball back where it came from is easier, all other things being equal. You run less. This is what we're gonna talk about and look at when you hit cross courts. And you attempt, you tempt your opponent to break all of those things when you hit cross court a lot. Meaning, let's, uh, let's switch over uh, really quickly here. Meaning, if you stay on a cross court pattern, let's say that the, the ball is traveling this direction a lot, back and forth, back and forth. Every time you, if, if this is you on this side, every time you send the ball back in this direction, your average tennis player is gonna be very tempted to try this shot, especially after the second time, the third time, the fourth time you give them the opportunity. They're gonna be kind of licking their chops at a certain point and just trying it because it's visually appealing, it's tactically appealing, like we kind of want that highlight shot. And so players are really tempted by it. So let's say we do hit a ball cross court and our opponent gets a forehand, the right-handed player on the other side. These green X's represent kind of the two far most targets that they could aim for. All the way <clears throat> down the line, as close to the line as possible, and a sharp ang angle that exits the court after it hits the courts. The reason why this third line is drawn is to represent the middle of those two potential shots that, that they could try. So when the ball is on the left side, you should be a little bit on the right side when you're on the baseline. So that means when you're receiving a ball on this side of the court and you're getting ready for a forehand, you basically have the option of saying, okay, I'm gonna take this, this shot and hit it this direction, which means now where are you gonna to have to recover? If you hit the ball from here to here, now your recovery spot is on this red X instead of the first one. So in effect, you're doubling the amount of running you have to do immediately following that shot. That's huge, it's really significant. So based on your decision, if you hit the ball here, you half the amount of running. If you hit the ball here, you double the amount of running. So over the span of an entire tennis match, this is really, really significant. And so it's not just geometry. When you hit this way, you've got more room for error over the net. You have more room for air inside the baseline, <clears throat> but you also minimize the amount of work that you have to do. And when you hit cross court a lot and you tempt your opponent to hit down the line, now you're tempting them to make that bad decision. And when they do make it, now you have the opportunity to run them twice as much because of that decision that they made. So occasionally you'll play somebody who's really good at hitting down the line. 
And <clears throat> we'll talk about that in a second. This is the general rule of thumb. And for all these reasons, hitting cross courts, remember this stat right here, what we're really trying to do is minimize our chances of making a mistake and minimize our effort and our work needed to hit a quality shot. So hitting cross court ticks a lot of boxes. Now, when you're at the net, it flips. And I'm gonna show you why in a second. A lot of, most people don't understand this. It flips completely. When you're at the net, it's the opposite. When you keep the ball in front of you, instead of hitting at a diagonal, you have more time to respond. And I'll show you why in a second. You hit yourself into position instead of out of position. You run less and you give your opponent smaller targets to aim for when you keep the ball in front of you, when you're at the net, when you're already at the net. So let me show you why. <clears throat> Part of the reason why I drew this middle line is to illustrate something. Let's say that instead of being at the baseline, we're at the net. And so you approach and come up to the net and put yourself right in the center of the net because you know you wanna cover that cross court passing shot, but you also wanna cover that down the line passing shot. So look at these, look at these angles. Look at that, look, look at the yellow lines. Is this person actually in the center of the possible passing shots from the other person? Look at how much space is available in this direction to hit past that net player versus how much space is available this way to hit past the net person. The net person's in the middle, but the middle's not actually the middle anymore. Look at how this line traces and eventually crosses over the middle of the court, and now it's on the same side of the court as the ball. So here's a, a really good rule of thumb. When you're at the net in singles, you should be on the same side of the court as the ball. And the further over the ball is, the further over you should be to account for this spread of angles. It flips on the baseline because of how this geometry works. All the way back at the baseline, you wanna be on the other side of the court. So on the baseline, you should be opposite on the right side of the court when the ball is on the left. And at the net, you should be on the left side of the court when the ball is on the left. So that's why everything is flipped. If you receive a volley here and you angle it over there, well, where do I need to get to next? Before my opponent hits that next passing shot, I need to get all the way over to this side of the court. And because you're at the net, your amount of time to respond is really, really low. So if you hit this volley and you can't get all the way over here before your opponent gets to the ball, well, you just left an easy target. You made more running for yourself. And so your job being a good tennis player becomes dramatically more complicated and more difficult. So all this boils down to is this. Here's, the, here's your plan A <clears throat> for every match. This is, this is your mindset and this is your strategy and your, your playbook every time you begin a singles match from the baseline based on everything we just talked about. Hit the ball cross court unless you have a good reason to hit down the line. So a good reason might be, well, my opponent's best shot is cross court. So every time I get a forehand and I hit them a forehand, they just hit a winner. Okay, that's a good reason to avoid that big strength. Or maybe they're really out of position and so they're leaving a huge chunk of court open down the line. Okay, good reason to go down the line. Maybe you're receiving a short ball and you're going to be approaching or attacking. That can be a really good reason to go down the line. But there has to be a good reason. <laughs> Otherwise, remember that, that big list of things? Otherwise, all of these things are working against you. So there has to be a good enough reason to counteract all of these things, and then you can go down the line. And a lot of times it's there, but most of the time it's not. Most of the time you should be hitting cross court. So that's from the baseline. And at the net, based on everything we just talked about, Keep the ball in front of you unless you have a good reason to hit away from yourself, aka cross court. So if you're receiving a low volley or let's say an approach shot, you haven't made your way all the way up to the net yet in an attacking position. If you don't have an offensive attacking opportunity, then you should keep the ball on the same side of the court that you're on. Otherwise, all of those challenging factors are coming into play. And remember, all those challenging factors. Um, you're gonna have less time. 
you hit yourself out of position when you hit cross court. You have to run more when you hit cross court. And you give your opponent bigger targets when you hit cross court. So if you don't go cross court for a good reason, like they're out of position or they've got a big strength or you have some like huge opportunity, then you just shoot yourself in the foot. So this is, this is your plan A. When you're at the baseline, hit cross court, unless you have a good reason to hit down the line. And when you're at the net, hit the ball in front of you. Keep it on your side of the court, unless you have a good reason to hit the ball cross court. Uh, so Matthew, hopefully that makes sense. Um, hopefully this really kind of simplifies things for you and uh, really gives you a starting point you know, for all your matches from here on out. And next question. All right, question number three. Uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying. Here's uh, question number three out of five coming at you. Um, I'm just getting over a cold, by the way. So I'm trying to be really like measured with my voice so I don't just sporadically just start coughing like a madman for five minutes straight. Hey, what's up, Baxter? All right. <clears throat> question three. How can you play to win? I love this question because it, it combines some technical stuff with some mental stuff. Um, this is a super common thing from John. How to play to win instead of playing not to lose. And in other words, how can I be more aggressive? So many players are super careful when they should be aggressive. So let's talk about exactly what John can focus on and what you all can focus on to avoid that trap. So there's two, two requirements. There's a technical requirement, and we're gonna talk about exactly what this is and how to do it. The technical requirement to avoid playing not to lose is to swing past the ball instead of through the ball. And we're gonna define exactly what this means in, in a second. And it all comes back to this phrase. We're gonna be talking about this phrase for the rest of the, the lesson today. The face sends it, meaning the racket face, the path bends it. Wherever the strings are facing at contact, that's where the ball is gonna go. Like that's the direction the ball is gonna travel. Whatever path the racket is on as the ball touches the strings, that's what gives the ball spin and can curve the ball or bend the ball. So this little phrase unlocks the key, or I guess the lock. <laughs> it's the key that unlocks the door for us to be able to be confident and aggressive at the same time. Curve just means that you can hit a faster shot without sacrificing consistency. So let's, let's talk about relative amounts of path. So remember, the face sends it, the path bends it. So let's take a look uh, really quickly here at two different, really different players. So this player is Juan Martin Del Potro, who hits really, really flat on average. Relative to professional players, his nickname is Thor, or his forehand's nickname is Thor's Hammer. Just crushing like big shots through the court is kind of his specialty. So I want you to watch the path of his racket through contact, just before contact and just after contact. If we draw a little bit of a, of a circle here, right before contact, and then at contact, and then just after contact, you'll see that there is a low to high path to this, but it's pretty subtle. It's not super aggressive, but it's worth noting, like he is still going from underneath the ball. But in terms of a professional tennis player hitting a forehand, this is about as level as you're gonna swing from back at the baseline. When you see players crushing a short ball, you'll see them swinging more level or maybe even slightly downwards but from back at the baseline for your average, you know, neutral ball or even attacking ball from just inside the baseline, he's a little bit inside the baseline here. He's just swing, swinging low to high a little bit. So another way to think about this <clears throat> is Delpo has more energy going this way than he has energy going this way. So if you think as, as like a 45 degree angle is being splitting it halfway in between, right? He's going more forwards than he is upwards. And that's because he's Del Potro. Now he does hit more low to high than this sometimes, but this is just a quick illustration. So now let's look at a totally different player. I'm gonna flip it just so that visually it's, it's consistent and kind of, we kind of get the idea together. 
So now let's look at that same thing. Let's look at the path of the racket here with somebody like Nadal, who is with way more spin than Del Potro. And watch the path now. Look at how much lower the racket is compared to the ball as he gets ready to hit. And watch the path of the racket this time. Super, super vertical. So if we draw those same kind of circles a little bit before contact, and then at contact, and then a little bit after contact, and look at the, look at the difference here. Now, Rafa's got a really vertical attack. So if we draw that same you know, ballpark 45 degree angle, now Rafa's breaking that to the upside and he's going super, super vertical. So what does that mean? Well, let's go back to our slides here really quick. The path bends it. So Del Potro's ball is gonna penetrate and move through the court much faster, all other things being equal, which is a lot of things, by the way, but just, I'm, I'm simplifying things here just to be able to understand it, just as an illustration. All other, all other things being equal, Del Potro's ball is gonna travel through the court much faster, whereas Nadal's ball is gonna curve a lot more. It's gonna have a lot more margin. So Nadal has a lot more safety, Del Potro has much more like offensive attacking potential. All of the things being equal. I, I, I know there's, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm not talking about a lot on purpose. So just to, just to kind of simplify it and keep it, keep it simple. So I just wanted to illustrate kind of that, that principle. So if you want to be able to attack on that weak serve, which is what we're, I'm sorry, wrong topic. If you want to play to win instead of playing not to lose, safety and curve and margin is super, super critical. If you're hitting everything like with minimum margin for error, like six inches over the net, one foot over the, the top of the net, and you wanna be careful on, on a point because it's a big point, you don't wanna blow it, you wanna, you wanna make sure that you, you kinda of stay in the point. If the only option for you is to slow down to be more careful, then you're always gonna play not to lose. But if you know how to curve the ball and shape it, now what we can do is start to swing fast without sacrificing consistency. And that's just like the holy grail for most tennis players. Most tennis players, it's kind of one or the other. I can either attack, but my margin for error is tiny, or I can be careful, and now I'm not playing to win. And so players kind of swing back and forth, back and forth. And they'll, they'll try to hit a big shot and miss it, and then all of a sudden, they're like, oh crap, well I don't wanna beat myself, so I'm, I'm gonna be careful, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it safe now. And then they'll be super, super tentative and they open the door for their opponent. Guess what, you don't have to play that all or nothing game. And the way you don't play it is by learning how to curve the ball. So this is the technical part of it. Technique wise, here's how you avoid playing not to lose. Now let's talk about the mental, because this is just as important. Let me grab a quick drink. You have to stop making losing the enemy. Too many, too many tennis players are so afraid of losing matches, and so they don't have any bravery. They're not willing to go for it because they're so afraid of the what, the what ifs. Like, oh man, if I lose to Steve, then I beat him last time, so that means I'm not getting any better. Or if I if I lose to Jane, then uh, I'm going to get bumped back down again. I really want to stick with my team or, you know, whatever it is. We, we have all those situations that kind of float around in our head and it causes us to play again, play it safe. So instead of accelerating through contact, we start decelerating because we're so afraid of what the outcome is going to be. The reality is losing is a huge part of tennis. It's a part of all sports. Of course, there's a winner and a, that's kind of the point of sports, right? Is to have an athletic competition and there's going to be somebody who wins and somebody who loses. But even when you win in tennis, you lose a lot. Rafael Nadal, this is a, this is a big uh, part of my, a big, a big part of one chapter of my book. Nadal, at the French Open, just the French Open, he's won 56% of his points and he's lost 44% of his points. Arguably the most dominant player at a single event in any sport all time. Maybe there's an example that's more dominant than, than him. I'm, I'm talking one athlete, one sport, 
one venue or event, I don't, I don't think there's a, an example of somebody being more dominant than Nadal at the French. And yet, 56% of his points he's won. That means throughout all those French Open trophy, you know, uh, runs that he's had, he's, he's lost almost half of his points. So for you, at, for the rest of us, even when we win like one and one or something like that, we're winning maybe six out of 10 of the points, maybe a total domination, seven out of 10. You have to get used to losing. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't mean like matches, like every match or anything like that. But if you're playing it so safe, if you're being so careful because you don't want to lose point after point after point, then blossoming into a high-level player is going to be next to impossible. There's something to think about. Start being more afraid of poor tennis than losing, and you'll be on your way to playing confident tennis and playing to win instead of playing not to lose. Uh, the, the more you're... And I, I've experienced this a lot personally, um, and I've had to come face-to-face -face with it, publishing all my matches, you know, online. Uh, and especially kind of like big matchups that I've had, like against Ben, you know, AKA MEP. I had just, I just had to come to a place where it's like, you know what? If I lose, I lose. And it's like, I'm going to, I'll learn something. I'll come away with some kind of part of my game that I know I need to improve. That's good. Like that's a valuable thing. And one way or another, like there's going to be a lesson to be learned from this. And sooner or later, you just have to kind of be able to sit there with the idea that I might lose this and that's Okay. I'm not saying be negative and be defeatist and say, oh, woe is me, and I'm just going to lose every match. I'm not, don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not saying that in the least. What I am saying is if you're the type of person that's like, oh, I can't even think about losing. Like, losing is not even possible. Like, I got to be positive. Like, uh, I got to, I got to manifest, you know, this victory and, you know, win, win, win. And like, you just put pictures of like people holding trophies all over the place. If, if that's the only outcome that sits right with you, like if that's the only outcome of your tennis that you're satisfied with and happy with, man, I'll tell you what, that'll, that'll cause anybody to play scared on the court. So something to think about. Hopefully that makes sense. You're not misunderstanding what I'm saying. Okay. Before we get to, let's see, what was that? Was that question number three? Before we get to question number four, uh, really quickly, this is not a sponsored lesson, but it is brought to you by Essential Tennis Academy. Um, if you'd like personal guidance from me about your technique, about your strategy, about your mental game, Essential Tennis Academy is just the best resource for tennis players, the whole gambit, everything. Uh, there's 56 coaching modules that cover every part of the game, baseline, net, double strategy, singles strategy, serving, returning, fitness, mental toughness, like the, the whole thing. Whatever you want to learn about, there's a whole module full of videos showing you step-by-step -step how to improve that thing. Um, I do weekly live Q&As where I, I do video analysis for players. I analyze strokes. Um, I answer questions. And it's just a one-stop shop for game improvement. So I highly recommend you check it out. It's over 100 drills in the drills library, 66 student films. It's me working like a, the full experience that I have with a student. And it costs less than cheap Netflix. <laughs> I just went, I, before I wrote this uh, today, I was like, how much does Netflix cost these days? The, there's a, apparently a 480p version of net, like a really super low res version of Netflix you can get now. It's even cheaper than that. So if you love tennis, you want to get better, I highly recommend you go check out EssentialTennisAcademy.com. All right. <clears throat> Question number four. How do you beat a weak second serve? So from Eric, we did three, right? Yeah. So from Eric, how do you defeat an opponent with a very weak second serve? I feel like I end up hitting them long and out with my return rather than taking advantage of it. Thanks. Yeah, so this is really, really common, Eric. Short balls in general, really common problem that players have. So you've got two choices. When a ball is slow enough, low enough, and short enough that you have to move inside the baseline, you've got two options. Option number one is slow down and be careful. 
Kind of like what we were talking about a second ago. And most players choose that option. And, and here's why. Let me, let me show you why really quickly. So let's, uh, let's get rid of these uh, lines really quickly. The reason why players slow down is they kind of intuitively understand that they have to account for less court. So uh, what I mean by that is, let's say that you're on the baseline, hitting a forehand from the, the deuce side, and you swing at a certain speed, confidence level, height, spin, all the rest of it, so the ball lands right there. Great, fantastic, nice, nice deep shot. <coughs> well, if the next time the ball comes over, it lands right here and it draws you inside the baseline. If you do everything else the same, then that next shot is gonna land here if you don't make any kind of adjustment. So tennis, you know, tennis players are smart, they get this, but they don't turn the right dials. They'll slow it down a little bit, be a little bit more careful. They'll aim a little bit lower over the top of the net because they, they know that they don't want to hit it too far. And they also understand kind of intuitively that they just moved 10 feet closer to their target. And so they have to account for that 10 feet somehow. And so usually the dials that get turned are the speed dial and the height dial. And as long as those are the dials that you turn, AKA as long as you're just careful with that shot, then your level is gonna to be totally limited. There's gonna be a, a huge glass ceiling that gets dropped over the top of you because you don't have the ability to move in and attack the way you're supposed to. And when we watch our favorite players on TV, it's really obvious, right? Those low, short shots, they're almost immediately in control and they're on, they're on the offense, they're on the attack. So how do we do that? Option number two is maintain swing speed, so don't turn the swing speed dial, but you actually might increase it. Instead of changing the dial downwards, what we really need to do is change the path. So remember that phrase, the face sends it, the path bends it. So if on the baseline, we hit a relatively flat shot, but when we get drawn 10 feet inside the baseline, we can consciously curve it and spin it to bend the ball into play on the other side. Now we no longer have to slow down. We don't have to play it safe and be careful. And this is really the secret to attacking that, that weak serve. So, so here's how you do it, like step by step. Number one, make contact as high as possible and as high as you're comfortable with because the higher you make contact, the better of an angle you have to the other side of the court. So that's number one. Number two, make the path at least as vertical as horizontal. So let me show you what I mean by that. So a moment ago, we looked at Nadal. And so let's go back to uh, that example of Nadal really quickly. So this red line is Nadal's swing path. That's more vertical than horizontal. He's swinging upwards with more intensity than he's swinging forwards. So that's gonna give him more curve relative to drive, you know, forward force. That's how you can start to keep these balls in play without slowing down. Now you don't necessarily have to swing like Nadal. I mentioned before that most players are at about a 45 degree angle. So here's a player that's kind of halfway in between Del Potro and Nadal. And that would be Federer. And I'm just talking about swing path. So D Del Potro is very, very flat, relatively speaking. Nadal is very, very vertical, relatively speaking, you know, compared to other elite, you know, world-class tennis players. Federer is like right in the sweet spot, halfway in between. So if we do that same basic, you know, really rough analysis and we draw a circle at contact, a circle just a couple frames before contact, and then a circle just a couple frames after contact, what we'll see is really close to a 45 degree angle. So he splits the difference between Del Potro 
who is much flatter than this, and Nadal, who is much more vertical than this. So for me personally, like this is kind of the, the benchmark that I'm looking for with the students that I teach. Like I'm looking for about a 45 degree angle with the path of the racket. Because that's more or less balancing out your forward force and your vertical force. So you can have a ball that travels through the court confidently while also having shape and curve for safety. And so you can kind of have the, the best of both worlds. So if let's just say, let's go to the uh, strategy court really, really quick. Let's just say that you get a really short ball and you're pulled way inside the baseline and the ball's like staying low to the court. Okay, now we need lots of vertical. So now we might actually need a path that kind of resembles what we saw from the doll before to get the ball up and have it get down on the other side. We need a lot of vertical swing. And so training this is critical. If you're halfway in between, then something like 45 degrees will probably get the job done. And if you're back behind the baseline, if you want to swing even flatter than that, you can. Or if your style is to hit a heavier ball, a higher bouncing shot on the other side, then, then do that. But the bottom line is you, you need, whoops, sorry about that. <laughs> Wrong button. The bottom line is you need options and you can't just have one flavor of forehand or one flavor of backhand or else, or else you get totally uh, pigeonholed. You get totally locked in to a particular delivery. And so when you get a ball that's a little bit deeper or a little bit shorter, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, now all of a sudden you don't have the ability to respond competitively. So many of us regular players have a way flatter path than we think. We've been told swing low to high a kajillion times. And it's like, oh yeah, uh, pff, yeah, of course. So I, so I, I swing low to high. This is the case with my, very much with my, my crappy backhand, you know, that I've been working on, was what felt like low to high to me was in reality, super level. So more than likely, you, who is the person uh, who asked this? More than likely, Eric, you have to work on, on swinging a little bit more vertical. Hopefully these examples of Del Potro, Nadal, Federer really make sense, like visually. And then thirdly, make very confident swings to very safe targets. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, let's go back to the, the court here. And let's say we have that kind of tweener ball, not super short, but it's not deep either. Rather than aim here for the red X, what I'm saying is make a really confident swing without letting your foot off the gas with appropriate vertical path. So you curve it and keep it in play and aim for the green X. This is what professional players are doing, but we really only perk up and pay attention when the ball lands like here. And we're like, oh man, he, they're so incre incredibly precise. Like, I, I can't believe he made that shot. Well, newsflash, they were probably aiming here with that shot, but it ended up being a little bit mistimed. And so it's closer to the line. And none of them are trying to hit a ball six inches from the line consistently, you know, over on individual shots. Yeah. Like maybe on the run, like passing shot. And it's like, well, I got to hit this perfect or else I lose the point. Sure. But on a rally ball or your average approach shot, they're not aiming six inches from the line. Give yourself plenty of margin for error. And so, uh, aim for something like this target right here with a confident swing. And that's going to be your recipe for success. The vast majority of the time. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, those are your three action steps there, Eric. Uh, hopefully that's super helpful. Uh, thanks for the great question. And we'll move on to uh, question number five. Almost lost it a couple of times here. I'm just hoping to hang on here and, and not just go into a crazy coughing fit. I'm happy I've made it this far. Let's we'll see if we can make it through uh, Ryan's question. <clears throat> I love this question. Uh, hey, what's up? I see Ira in the chat. I see uh, Matt Lemery in the chat. What's up, guys? All right, great question here from Ryan. Ryan says, how to analyze your own games or strokes and identify problems? And he, he has a, a very specific example here, which I'm going to give the, like the exact solution to. I've been working on my flat serve for weeks and I consistently hit the tape. 
I don't know what to adjust or what to look for that would cause this. I totally know what you're talking about, Ryan. It can feel like you're totally lost on something like that, where you keep making the same mistake and you like try turning different knobs like and dials to try to figure it out. And you're just not quite figuring it out. It's super frustrating. Another way to explore the idea, what different mistakes lead to what outcomes? For example, what are the most common slash expected outcomes or where does the ball end up if your serve toss is too far back, too low, too far out to the side? Same for forehand, backhand, volleys, etc. So I'm actually going to give you the solution, Ryan, to all tennis shots. And it's going to be the, the third time I reference this today. And it's really, it's that important. But then I'm going to give you like the exact specific solution to this exact problem, just as an illustration. So let's talk about it. This is the ma- man. This is the magical phrase. It just it it can help you explain or get to the get to the solution of just about anything in uh, in tennis. The face sends it, the path bends it. What that means is that wherever the strings are facing at contact, that's the direction the ball is going to travel. And the ball, by the way, is only on the strings for about four one thousandths of a second tiny, tiny, tiny split second. It's like a a fraction of the blink of an eye. The ball is on the strings. Wherever your strings are facing, that's the direction the ball is going to go. Meanwhile, the path the racket is traveling, at that instant, the ball touches the strings. That gives the ball spin or curve. And so it's combining those two that we can actually work our way back and figure out, okay, what, what do I adjust here? So let me show you an example here from a video that I made a while ago. <clears throat> and uh, in this example, uh, Kevin Garlington from Total Tennis Domination, he had a bunch of serves, the same type of serves, a flat serve each time. And he didn't even really know what I was doing. <laughs> but I, I asked him, hey, Kevin, do me a favor and hit the baseline with a serve while I recorded it. And I asked him to hit a whole bunch of different serves to weird spots. I asked him to hit the bottom of the net with a serve. And now this is the difference in racket face angle between hitting the baseline, so 18 feet long, and hitting the bottom of the net, not even close to over the net. So you're, you're talking about hitting the tape over and over and over again. The difference between hitting the baseline and hitting the bottom of the net so we're, we're talking about, uh, what is it from baseline to, baseline to baseline is 78. Uh, what is it on one side? So is that 39? Yeah. So we're talking about a, like a 40 foot difference and how far the ball travels, 19 degrees of difference in the angle. Now I'm going to just play just a couple seconds of this video just to give a little bit more context. But now you understand like what's happening here. I just kind of skipped the first like minute or two of the video. Uh, if you want to see the whole video, by the way, it's called Tennis Science, Serve Accuracy and Consistency. So uh, just listen to this really quickly as I explain it in the video. Prince and racket face angle between hitting the bottom of the net and missing your serve 18 feet long on the other side of the baseline is only 19 degrees. For every one degree of angle that your racket face is off at contact, you're missing your target by over two feet. So d- did you hear that? One degree of racket face angle on a flat serve equals two feet in difference in where the ball goes. Just, just let, let that sink in for a second. So you're, you're talking about like hitting the tape. We're talking about, you know, what's the tape? Three inches or something like that. Uh, some, something much smaller than two feet. So we're, ta- we're talking about differences in racket face angle of fractions of one degree. The difference between hitting the tape and then missing the tape by whatever, a couple inches, two or three inches, right? Uh, Just listen to just a little bit more of this, just just for context here. Diving another layer deeper reveals some incredible stats. We shot these videos at 240 frames per second, which means each individual frame of movement represents four thousandths of a second in real time. That's just four milliseconds. There are just two frames of movement in Kevin's swing between his racket face being at a 105 degree angle before contact and 86 degrees at contact when he hit the bottom of the net. So the timing difference between hitting the bottom of the net 
and hitting the baseline on the other side of the court, 39 feet away, is only eight thousandths of a second. Okay, so hopefully your mind should be exploding right now. Eight thousandths of a second is the difference between hitting the baseline on the other side of the court and the bottom of the net. So what, what are we talking about? When we're talking about hitting the, the net tape and then hitting the net tape and then hitting the net tape. Well, first of all, congratulations. Like that's unbelievably precise <laughs> to be able to hit the same like couple inches again and again and again. You know, obviously you're not hitting the tape like five or six times in a row, but it feels like that, right? When we kind of repetitively, you know, whatever, two or three times out of 10, we hit the tape. It feels like that's kind of all we're doing is, is hitting the tape. The reality is a tiny, tiny adjustment in the angle of your racket is going to send the ball someplace completely different. So notice, so about your flat serve. So notice the differences here in Kevin's racket. His racket here is more closed. It's facing a little bit more down. And his racket here is a little bit more open. It's facing a little bit more up. That's it. <laughs> like, that's the difference. Now, how do we change that? Well, toss location has a lot to do with it. If you toss the, the ball a couple inches further in front, your racket kind of has to keep moving to get there. And that t usually tends to close the racket face a little bit more. So you can, you can experiment with tossing a little bit further back or a little bit further in front. For you, since you keep hitting the tape, we need the ball to travel a little further, which means we need the face a little bit more open, which means I'd recommend you try tossing back a little bit further. Your racket face in this particular example is a little bit too closed. So I'm constantly thinking about, as a, as a coach, as a teacher, because students come to me with all kinds of different problems, but it all comes back to this. And there's different reasons why our face might be a little too open or a little too closed, uh, or the path is a little bit too flat or a little bit too vertical or a little bit too out to the side or, you know, whatever it is. Like there's, it's more complicated than this. I'm, I'm just trying to simplify it so that the re so everybody watching can apply this to all tennis shots. And like every shot in tennis comes back to these two variables. And then from there, you can kind of play a little bit of detective and ask yourself the question, okay, so why would that be happening? Why would my racket face be a little bit open? Why would my racket face be a little bit, little bit closed? So on and so forth. <clears throat> so here's the questions, Ryan. Here's the questions you want to ask yourself. Did the ball go directly to a bad place, like wide or net or deep? And if the answer to that is yes, then the racket face at contact is off. It's facing the wrong way. And usually that has to do with timing or contact point, just like we talked about with your serve. So the other question you could add, like the other, it's going to generally fall into two kind of big buckets. And I'm, this, I'm generalizing here. This, this, this is kind of all other things being equal, you know, kind of advice. Uh, there are different combinations of the many other different variables at play that could cause these things to not be 100% accurate all the time. But this is, gonna, this is a catch-all that covers the vast majority of situations, okay? Just, I'm just saying that for all the, the technique nerds out there who are going to be like, no, -uh, what about, you know, like X, Y, Z? This is a, a broad generalization just to help people start to think critically and start to reverse engineer some of this stuff to, to get a little bit more understanding. So if the ball goes directly to a bad place, your racket face at contact was off. Did the ball go generally kind of, you know, basically in the direction you were aiming, but just missed by a little bit deep or into the net? Well, if that's the case, more than likely your swing path is a little bit too straight. And so your shot is traveling like too, too straight, too flat. There's no margin. We need a little bit more shape to give us a little bit of breathing room. Otherwise, we're going to keep missing a little bit long and then a little bit short and then a little bit long and a little bit short. That, that is a symptom of your shot being too direct. And we don't have any curve to give us a little bit of, of margin, a little bit of breathing room to be able to have a little bit of wiggle room you know, to work with. I think that's all the synonyms I know for that. <laughs> margin, breathing room, uh, wiggle room. There you go. We need, we need a little bit of space to work with. 
Otherwise, man, hitting a ball in the court over and over is it's freaking hard, man. I mean, it's we have to be so precise, and hopefully just that quick snippet of that video really kind of illustrates that for you. So this is how I recommend you think about it for all shots in tennis. I also gave you the specific answer for your specific issue of hitting the tape. So hopefully that's super helpful. All right, with that, I'm gonna, man, I, I'm just really proud of myself for making it through, frankly, and not just going into a, a death spiral of like coughing. Uh, I'm really happy I made it through today. Um, this is my first time trying this format, so um, I hope you enjoy it. A <clears throat> big thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Uh, Ryan, Eric, John, Matthew, and Daniel. Thank you so much. If you want me to answer your question, then you can leave it in the comments section down below of this video. And hopefully I'll, I'll use it in a future episode of these live broadcasts. I uh, can't guarantee that I will, but I'll do my best. Um, our option number two, if you want my personal feedback every week and like a guarantee, like I will answer your question or review your video every single week, then go to EssentialTennisAcademy.com and sign up for Academy. <clears throat> so a uh, big thank you everybody uh, who's watching live. I uh, really appreciate you all a lot. Uh, Javi, what's up? Joseph, uh, Lenora, uh, ALK, HD, uh, Joey. Saw Ira in there, saw Matt in there. All kinds of people stopping by. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Leave your questions down below for a future episode. And I'll catch you guys next time. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for your support. I appreciate it.